with just over a week to the federal budget and economic debate taking centre stage once again. Labor's Shadow Assistant Treasurer Dr Andrew Lee and Assistant Treasurer Michael Suka join me now. Welcome to National Wrap. Great to be with you, PK. Thanks, Patricia. Under Labor's proposal, Michael, it was announced today tampons and women's sanitary products would no longer be taxed. Why doesn't the government move in this direction as well, given these products are a necessity? Well, Patricia, under the intergovernmental agreement, it requires uh, any change to the base or rate of the GST requires uh, the consent uh, of all of the states and territories, including the Commonwealth. And as recently as 2015, we took this to the Council of Federal Financial Relations, the essentially the Treasurer's COAG. Uh, we put it forward in 2015. Uh, the states and territories couldn't agree to it. And since then, none of the states and territories have raised it. So the announcement from Labor today was um, meaningless without uh, a signed piece of paper from every one of those states and territories saying they supported this, because without their support, it doesn't change. So, Andrew, is that right? You ha you have, do you have their support? Patricia, there's a simple reason Joe Hockey couldn't get this done in 2015, and that's because he couldn't find an offsetting source of revenue. Uh, what we've done today, and it's a real credit to Catherine King, Chris Bowen, Tanya Plibersek and Bill Shorten, uh, is to identify uh, natural therapies not supported by clinical evidence and under a bipartisan policy uh, not uh, supported by the private health insurance rebate uh, and say that we, wouldn't, uh, we would put the GST onto those uh, natural therapies and as a result provide the additional revenue. Indeed, over the decade we've, uh, we're providing the states with more revenue uh, from the natural therapies decision than from the tampon tax decision. But it's the kind of positive policy that you'd expect to be coming out of a party room that's now 48% women. So Michael Suka, you say you couldn't get it through, but is it in your ideal scenario, would you like to get agreement with the well, states Well, Andrew, Andrew Lee's just admitted right there that they don't have the consent of the states and territories. Today... But I'm asking, to, would you ideally to, like to get well, the consent of the states? Well, Patricia, today was meaningless without a piece of paper from every single sure, state but and territory saying that they support this. but my question to you is, is it worth this. trying to pursue getting the support of the states well, on we this? Well, we tried in 2015. But would you do no, it again? No state has raised this with us. If a state raised it and brought it forward to the... Uh, Council of Federal Financial Relations, of course it would be considered, but we can't unilaterally make this decision as we uh, most recently found out in 2015. And again, today was a great photo op for the Labor Party, but they should have had a piece of paper there with the signatures of every single state and territory treasurer. The, re the fact that they didn't means it was a pointless photo opportunity. Michael, the news coming out of the Banking Royal Commission has been shocking. Should AMP Chairwoman Catherine Brenner take responsibility and resign? That's what Jim Chalmers from Labor has called for. Well, Patricia, I would say uh, in the end, uh, the leader of any organisation must take responsibility. One of the things that the government has done through the banking uh, accountability regime is to say no more will there be buck passing uh, in these large organisations. Someone's got to take accountability. I'm not going to speak about individual cases other than the broad point that, of course, uh, leaders of organisations must uh, be accountable for the actions. So she should those resign. No, I'm not saying that. I don't want to. I, I don't think it's appropriate for a government and indeed an opposition to actually speak about specific cases. Uh, I think, though, the general principle that I'd agree on, and I, I'm sure Andrew would agree on, is uh, those in the uh, leadership of organisations, whichever it is, including corporates and banks, uh, they should take account for the actions of those who work for them. Andrew Lee, should she resign? I think uh, Jim Chalmers has made, uh, made the right uh, comment there and it reflects the uh, evidence that's coming out, uh, advice being charged to uh, dead people, uh, the impersonating of clients, the falsifying of signatures. Uh, and you've got Malcolm Turnbull saying that uh, he's, uh, he's very cross about what he's seeing coming out. Uh, indeed, he's so cross that he's going to provide a $13 billion company tax cut to the big banks. Uh, when they hear news like that, I imagine most Australians wish that Malcolm Turnbull would get angry with them from time to time. Uh, the fact is the government fought against this Royal Commission. Uh, they tried to water down the Labor's future financial advice reforms, which required the best interest duty for financial advisers. Uh, and we're seeing uh, evidence coming out now which clearly vindicates Labor's position uh, on the Royal Commission. Michael, your Liberal colleague Sarah Henderson wants the Australian Securities and Investments Commission to be overhauled after the corporate regulator conceded it negotiated rather than prosecuted misconduct cases. Should it be overhauled? Do you agree? Well, Patricia, uh, I think if you look at the work that Kelly I. Dwyer has done recently, I mean, a new uh, commissioner of uh, ASIC has been appointed, a new deputy, deputy commissioner has been appointed 
uh, to take charge of these exact types of issues. I think uh, a lot of that overhauling has occurred, but uh, there's no doubt that um, corporate regulators uh, in whichever area they are in uh, need to reflect uh, on themselves when uh, really bad conduct like this occurs. I mean, it was, uh, you know, during the uh, years when uh, Bill Shorten was the uh, Minister for Financial Services when a whole host of uh, pretty bad things happened with financial advisors. Storm Financial collapsed, it left people uh, losing uh, literally everything they'd ever built up. Um, uh, no action was taken then, but Kelly O'Dwyer has certainly taken an action. I'd say that one of the outcomes of the Banking Royal Commission, I suspect, will be uh, a really good look at how the regulators um, weren't able to pick some of this pretty egregious conduct up. Andrew Lee, on the turnaround in the budget position, which has seen the NDIS and the Medicare levy go, we know that a few years ago everyone was talking about, well, the government at least, a budget emergency. Do you give the government credit for getting that under control? Well, we've seen uh, the deficit this year being eight times larger than it, uh, it was uh, projected to be when the government came into office, Patricia. Uh, we have uh, net debt now doubled, uh, gross debt going through the half a trillion dollar barrier. Uh, and indeed, the uh, increase in the rate of Australia's debt is more rapid than it was during the global financial crisis. Uh, so what the government needs to do is to drop their big business tax cut. Uh, that's the most expensive policy on the table at the moment, and yet the government's own number say it would add only 0.1% to household incomes in the 2030s. Uh, it's simply not a policy which is going to boost uh, wages. The first round beneficiaries are going to be overseas shareholders. So for goodness sake, if we're concerned about the budget, then let's drop that $65 billion uh, unfunded corporate tax cut, just as, the, uh, just, uh, just as the government has made the right call finally on the Royal Commission, finally made the, made the right, uh, right call on the Medicare levy for low okay, income so earners. Michael, uh, hopefully they'll finally make the right call on the corporate tax Michael cut. Michael Suker, part of the problem with you for the corporate tax cut is that of course the banks get it and get a quite a big share of it. Even some of the crucial Senate crossbenchers you need don't support it because of that element. That's a pretty big issue for you, isn't it? People don't think the banks deserve a corporate tax cut. Well, Patricia, I'll, I'll touch on that. But I mean, uh, the reality is um, that that diatribe from Andrew uh, failed to mention that uh, irrespective of uh, those very contorted supposed facts he outlined that Labor's budget deficit at the last election was $16 billion uh, worse than uh, the government. So uh, what he's saying is bad. Uh, he's saying, well, we're $16 billion at least worse. And I think that gap has grown exponentially. Uh, on the banks, Patricia, my view is uh, whether you love banks or you hate banks, uh, they're the arteries of the economy. They're an integral part of the economy because every small business uh, whether they want to expand, whether they want to buy a new piece of plant and equipment, whether they want to potentially so you uh, might say that, employ more there staff. There is no support they, for they your need, tax cut they for the need, banks. They need finance. Uh, I think once we get to the point where we start carving out certain sectors uh, or another from corporate tax cuts, uh, I think that is wrong. And let's remember, uh, we're not reducing taxes out of some benevolence to corporate Australia. We're reducing taxes because uh, we have one of the highest corporate tax rates in the OECD. We need to compete for mobile global capital. We want them to invest money here, create jobs here, create prosperity here. And uh, the small business tax cuts which Labor have opposed, I think we've seen the benefit of those already with, um, with uh, hundreds of thousands of new jobs, uh, records jobs growth coming at a time when uh, we've given small businesses that tax relief uh, and they've paid uh, dividends to the economy through additional jobs and that will continue with the remainder of our corporate tax plan. John Howard has said tonight, it's in a story published by the Australian newspaper, that he, he, he thinks perhaps that top rate of the immigration intake should be looked at. I wonder what you think, Michael Suka. Do you think it's too high? I mean, now we've heard, of course, uh, Tony Abbott, your former leader and prime minister, say that it is, and now uh, a former and very respected prime minister, John Howard, saying the same. Should it be looked at? Well, I think John Howard said it's worthwhile having a debate, and I think clearly we're having that debate, Patricia, the fact that we're speaking about it tonight, the fact it's been spoken about before. The reality is, again, we don't, uh, outside of our special humanitarian intake, we don't run a benevolent uh, uh, regime of immigration. We bring people uh, into this country who our economy need, who uh, the, the relied on our prosperity, we need uh, to ensure our economy continues uh, ticking over at the rate we would like. 
Uh, the issue is, and I, I, I know this coming from Melbourne, a big growing city, indeed a city that's taking in uh, more net migrants than any other city. That is how our cities cope uh, with that additional migration. That's the heart of the issue. And if governments uh, can ensure that infrastructure keeps up, uh, I think uh, a lot of the other issues go away. And that's why a big part of this year's budget, as you've already seen, uh, has been infrastructure, including the $5 billion committed uh, to so the don't airport cut, rail here in Melbourne. Don't cut the top rate, don't cut that, that cap but just build more infrastructure. Is that your message? No, my message, Patricia, is once you've got control of your borders, as our government has, you can make decisions as we do every year uh, in our national interest. And we will continue to make decisions on how many migrants to bring to Australia in our national interest. I'm making the broader point that I think some of the anxiety in the community comes from the fact that they want to see infrastructure keeping up with an increased population and I think that's completely understandable. Andrew Lee, is it just all about infrastructure? Does that top cap need to be looked at? Well, as an economist, uh, Patricia, I've always thought that uh, migration isn't just about more mouths to feed, it's about more minds to inspire, more muscles to build. Uh, migrants are more likely to start a new business, more likely to file a patent, more likely to be exporters. Uh, we have great migrant success stories in Australia, not just filling jobs but also creating them. Uh, the uh, estimates from the Migration Council are that migrants uh, that come in this year uh, will over their lifetimes add trillions to the economy uh, and the Treasury said they'll add billions to the budget bottom line. Uh, we do need to tackle infrastructure, Michael's absolutely right about that. Uh, the problem is we're sliding down those uh, international uh, rankings of infrastructure spending, such as the recent one from the World Economic Forum. Uh, projections for infrastructure spending as a share of GDP uh, have it falling markedly over the course of the next decade, as Anthony Albanese has been pointing out. Uh, so we've got to do a whole lot better on infrastructure uh, and similarly on housing. Uh, we need uh, policies that uh, ensure that we get more housing affordability. Uh, Labor's housing affordability plan uh, not just uh, addresses the over generous tax concessions that are seeing investors beat out first home buyers but also restores the Housing Supply Council uh, and with uh, Doug Cameron's leadership uh, tackles the issue of homelessness. Uh, we've got to do this, as Michael says, through smart policies uh, but where I differ from him is I don't see those smart policies coming forward from the Coalition. Michael, just on something personal that has been in the news in relation to you, termites is what you called moderates in your own party. You just had the Liberal State Council, so let's cut to the chase. Do you support all sitting members of the House of Reps and Senators being pre-selected again in the Victorian branch? Well, Patricia, can I just say uh, I, I don't uh, concede that I called anyone in my party a termite. What I, but I've heard the term. What, I, oh, speak, hello, what, I, the what I speak about very often in fact, but hang on a minute, it is the word fact, you used. Correct. It's, yeah. part of, it's part of my stump speech, in fact. I talk about public institutions uh, often being hollowed out from people with radical agendas. Uh, and I say one of the last bastions uh, of our uh, country where that hasn't occurred has been the Liberal Party. And it's a great success of the Liberal Party. And I can assure you, it's a very popular view in the Liberal Party that we don't want... Uh, radical left wingers infiltrating our party. Uh, our, what but are moderates in your party what, radical left wingers of, really? Of course not. But what we speak about at our branch meetings are pretty colourful affairs, and I'd say anyone okay. that wants to join the party should, because we have. Okay, this great is the ABC. We're not recruiting for the Liberal Party here, but I do want to check: Will you back all sitting MPs and senators? for pre-selection again? Well, Patricia, our party uh, is democratic. Uh, it's not up to one member no, but or I'm another. I'm wondering what your view is. Well, I don't get a vote in pre-selections, well, What is your view? The do you members support them all? get votes in pre-selections. Do pre you support them all? Of course, I support all my colleagues so you want them in every all to be returned? way, shape or form. Uh, but in the end, we're a democratic party and it's up to the members and it's not my place as a member of parliament uh, to tell members of our party what they should or shouldn't do. Michael Suker and Andrew Lee, thank you so much for your time on National.